Wherever too many people live squeezed in one room or too many families live jammed together, there are the slums. In 1945, 38-year-old J.D. Shelley and his wife Ethel purchased a modest two-story brick home on Labadee Avenue in North Central St. Louis. What they didn't realize is that, by law, they technically weren't allowed to buy that house even though the previous owner willingly sold it to them, even though they paid the asking price. Because J.D. and his wife Ethel, and each of their six children, were all black. What followed would be known as one of the most significant decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court, but you've probably never heard of it. And despite what should have been seen as a sweeping condemnation of racial segregation in housing, that segregation continued through overt fear-mongering of white residents, white flight, a practice known as blockbusting, as well as through overt and covert government actions meant to ensure that white neighborhoods remained white and undesirables were pushed into overcrowded, underfunded, industrial neighborhoods in virtually every metropolitan area in the United States. Roll the intro. Before we get into the story of J.D. and Ethel Shelley and how our government has enforced racial segregation in every city in America, I want to thank my partner on today's video, Warby Parker. I got my at-home try-on kit! If you don't know, you can order five pairs of glasses for free from Warby Parker so you can try on the frames and see which look best on you before you buy. The at-home try-on kit ships free and includes a prepaid shipping label. I love Warby Parker. I've been using them for years. When I went to law school in Boston, I would go to the Warby Parker store in the Prue and just try on on frames because I was exhausted and sad mostly thanks to law school and I found it really calming to try on new identities and see what my life would be like. And when I finally ordered my glasses I could also go there and get them adjusted to fit my stupid ears because one is higher than the other but don't look at my ears. Ew. Yes, Warby Parker has physical stores, and yes, you can go in and they'll adjust your Warby Parker glasses. It's great. So you could say that Warby Parker was my happy place in law school. And they don't just offer eyeglasses. You can also get eye exams, sunglasses, and contacts online or in stores. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. So lately I've been really into masculine frames, so let me try on some of these for you. I've been trying some different black frames with varying degrees of success. Yeah, these are, you know, your, your favorite high school art teacher. I can already tell these are going to be very nerdy. Yeah, but they're very light. It's like they're not even there. These ones, let me see. Yeah, I feel like I look like a scientist in these specifically. Then we have a, then we have a classic matte black frame. Very studious, very chic. And then these boys are a bit of a wild card, but I thought they looked kind of trendy. Oh yeah. What is it? 1972, please. Also with Warby Parker, you can get 15% off when you purchase two or more pairs of prescription eyeglasses or sunglasses. So get a little pair of glasses for reading, another little pair for the sun, just saying. Go to warbyparker.com slash Leja to order your home try-on kit for free today. The Shelley family moved from Mississippi to St. Louis in 1930 to escape racial antagonism in the South. JD was 23 and had been working as a laborer in sawmills, on railroads, and in construction. By the time the family left, Mississippi, dominated by Jim Crow era laws, was known for racism, the KKK, and lynchings. In Mississippi alone, nearly 500 black people had been lynched by 1930 when the family packed their bags and decided to leave. Black people in Mississippi were expected to adhere to a strict code of behavior, expected to show deference, subservience, and obedience to whites, and any disobedience was grounds for lynching. According to historian Neil R. McMillan, the years from 1889 to 1919 were among the most repressive in Mississippi's history by nearly any measure. The frequency and sadism of lynching and other forms of white vigilantism, the extension and formal codification of black disenfranchisement, segregation, and exclusion the prejudicial character of the criminal justice system, and the prevalence of peonage. It was in this context that J.D. and Ethel Shelley left Mississippi, hoping for better treatment and more safety for their six children in St. Louis, Missouri. This safety was, of course, relative. Missouri had only experienced 60 reported lynchings compared with Mississippi's 500. But St. Louis still had laws and ordinances that enforced segregation, including bans on interracial marriages and relationships, and segregated schools. St. Louis was further segregated 
segregated not by explicit laws and regulations, but by private residential agreements. The Supreme Court had outlawed racially restrictive ordinances in 1917, meaning cities couldn't overtly bar black people from living in white neighborhoods and vice versa. But that's never stopped racists has it. Now, they had many other ways of ensuring that neighborhoods remained segregated. One way was by adding what are called restrictive covenants to their deeds when building and selling houses. You learn about restrictive covenants in the first year of your property law class in law school. They are rules that the owner of a property can impose on subsequent owners. Sometimes they're pretty innocuous, like no subsequent owners of this property can plant apple trees anywhere on said property. Those are usually perfectly legal. But racists got clever at the beginning of the 20th century and started adding restrictive covenants to their deeds that said things like, and I quote, the real property above described or any portion thereof shall never be occupied, used, or resided on by any person not of the white or Caucasian race, except in the capacity of a servant or domestic employed thereon as such by a white Caucasian owner, tenant, or occupant. Through the use of these restrictive covenants, owners were able to ensure that subsequent buyers of their property would always be white. The pesky problem with this kind of language in a deed of sale is that it's a private contract between the buyer and the seller. So if the seller wants to sell to a black person and they find a black person willing to buy, even if there's a race-based restrictive covenant, there's nothing that can stop them. A neighbor can't come in and try to enforce the private contract because they're not a party to the contract. So increasingly, entire neighborhoods would come together and enter into private contracts saying that they would never ever sell their houses to black people. That way, all the neighbors who signed on to the contract then had the right to sue if any other neighbor turned around and sold their home to a black person. And they would create the contracts to run with the land, as they say in the biz, meaning that it was binding to the property and to subsequent owners of the property, meaning these racially restrictive agreements were then taken on by subsequent buyers of the same property. This is also the reason why homeowners associations were created, to restrict blacks from entire subdivisions. So there's a fun fact to bring up at your racist great aunt's barbecue next week. And this practice was pervasive in virtually every major city and suburb in the United States for the first half of the 20th century. And these restrictive covenants were upheld again and again by courts across the country as perfectly constitutional because they were private agreements between private parties, not state action against a certain race. And despite the fact that it was acknowledged that government sanctioned and enforced housing restrictions would be unconstitutional, the government continued to restrict access to housing for black Americans, especially via the FHA. The Federal Housing Administration was created in 1934 in response to the Great Depression to allow the U.S. government to help fund the purchase of housing, thus creating desperately needed construction jobs and helping people who had been flattened by the Depression get back on their feet and purchase property. The way the FHA worked is by using government funds to ensure private bank mortgages that covered 80% of purchase prices and had terms of 20 years. Because the FHA is the one insuring the mortgage on the house, the FHA then insisted on doing its own appraisal of the property to make sure that the loan had a low risk of default. That's what insurers do. They see whether the risk is high or low, and they prefer to insure lower risk things because then they get to keep their money. And what was in the handbooks and manuals for all FHA insurance appraisal agents? A whites-only restriction. Basically, the FHA, as well as other mortgage insurers had determined that black home buyers were too risky. What's more, they determined that even if the home buyer was white, if the home was located near black neighborhoods or in neighborhoods where black people also resided, it was too risky to insure the mortgage, making the homes impossible to buy, especially for black buyers. Because if the FHA wouldn't insure the mortgage, banks usually wouldn't lend the money to buy the home. And while it's no longer the policy of the FHA to not insure black home buyers, the idea that black homeowners and black neighbors are inherently poorly kept is an idea that persists to this day. The idea that when black people move in, the neighborhood deteriorates because of some, I don't know, shortcoming on the part of black people. But let's take a damn step back. Okay, because as with all things, this is a myth that was created by racism and is actually the fault of white supremacy. Let's use St. Louis as an example because that's where our story about the Shelleys takes place. At the beginning of the 1900s, St. Louis city planners deliberately zoned for single-family only homes in white neighborhoods with restrictive covenants, guaranteeing that those neighborhoods would remain intact and whites only. In neighborhoods with predominantly black populations and land near those neighborhoods, they zoned for multifamily homes and industrial 
development, including polluting industry. Not only that, but the commission permitted taverns, liquor stores, nightclubs, and houses of prostitution to open in African-American neighborhoods, but prohibited them in white neighborhoods. They also allowed for the subdivision of properties located in black neighborhoods, but not in white neighborhoods. And in this atmosphere, with black would-be homeowners completely barred from purchasing most homes, black homeowners were pushed into industrial zoned, polluted locations littered with strip malls and liquor stores. And because they couldn't obtain FHA insured loans to buy the few homes available to them, they often had to rent out rooms or live together with family members and overcrowd what little housing was available to them. And when those houses inevitably began to break down from overuse, they didn't have the funds to repair the houses, leading to the perception that black people degrade the value of neighborhoods, when in fact they were simply surviving in the squalor that white supremacy made for them. It was in this reality that the Shelley family attempted to find a home to purchase in St. Louis. They worked with a real estate agent who was recommended to them by their pastor, and he found them a house in a white neighborhood where the seller was willing to sell to them as a black family. They bought the house and moved in. However, unbeknownst to the Shelleys, in 1911, a restrictive covenant was placed on the house between the surrounding houses and was still attached to their home. It said, and I quote, Hereafter, no part of said property or any portion thereof shall be, for said term of 50 years, occupied by any person not of the Caucasian race, it being intended hereby to restrict the use of said property for said period of time against the occupancy as owners or tenants of any portion of said property for resident or other purpose by people of the Negro or Mongolian race." End quote. And then Louis Kramer, a homeowner whose property was part of the restrictive covenant, sued the Shelleys to evict them from their home and get the court to declare the sale of the home to the Shelleys as a breach of the legally binding restrictive covenant. The Missouri court sided with Kramer, saying that the agreement was between private parties, so it was enforceable. The case wound its way up to the Supreme Court, which was faced with the question, are race-based restrictive covenants constitutional, and can they be enforced by a court of law? The court held that while the race-based restrictive covenants may not necessarily be unconstitutional, because the Constitution applies to state actors, and this was a private agreement between private individuals, so, okay, not necessarily unconstitutional. However, they are not legally enforceable by state courts because by enforcing the covenants, the state courts were taking government or state action to enforce a racially restrictive covenant, and that is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment because then it becomes state action when the court enforces it. So the practical effect of this ruling was to make any existing and future racially restrictive covenants unenforceable in court. You can write them, and you can even abide by them privately, but a court isn't going to step in and enforce them if someone subsequently breaks the covenant and sells to a black person. Despite how divided the country was on this issue, this was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. Kind of. It was a six to zero vote. Yes, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and there were in 1948 when this case was decided. But three of those nine justices, one third of them, had to recuse themselves because they lived on property subject to a race-based restrictive covenant. You see, this is back when Supreme Court justices would recuse themselves if they or their families were even tangentially related to the case at hand, such that they could be biased in one way or another, but... We've done away with that silly formality. Thanks, Clarence. While this case played out in court, the Shelleys remained in their home at 4600 Labadee Avenue in St. Louis. On the day of the ruling, J.D. Shelley recounts, and I apologize, pretend that this is in a nice Southern accent. He said, when I got home that evening, my wife was sitting on the front porch reading the paper that says we won the case. That night, the photographer come and we was sitting on the couch with the kids betwixt us and some on the floor, and they had it in the newspaper. We lived in that house on Labadee for maybe 10 years. I kept on working in construction long as I could, and my kids and their kids were all working too. Right now, I got five great-great-grandchildren. Ethel passed on September 15th, 1984. We was married 60 years, and when we had our anniversary, they had a big ceremony over to the church. The way I see it, it was a good thing that we done this case. We was the first ones to live where they said colored couldn't live. 4600 Labadee Avenue is still a private residence in St. Louis, though it's been dubbed a historical landmark, and the Google Street View shows a little plaque out front commemorating the home's role in one of the most important Supreme Court cases in the 20th century. And with that, 60 years of segregated housing and 200 years of slavery and racism were done away with, and everyone lived in racially integrated neighborhoods forever after. The end. Just kidding. 
I'm just kidding, you guys. Like I said, racists can't be dissuaded that easily. The FHA, remember the government agency that insures mortgages but wouldn't insure mortgages for black people or in neighborhoods where black people live? Yeah, they were like, listen, that decision, it's about restrictive covenants and that doesn't even apply to us, okay? I don't even know what you're talking about. They willfully ignored the ruling, saying that it wasn't their business if people wanted to continue and use racially restrictive covenants on the houses they were insuring mortgages for. That was private business between private individuals Individuals. And their policy not to insure mortgages for Blacks or in Black neighborhoods was just based on pure facts and figures, okay? When Blacks move into a neighborhood, the values immediately depreciated and they couldn't risk that. It was just bad business. But of course, we discussed this already. This perception was a product of white supremacy and the FHA or any other insurance or mortgage company never produced actual evidence that when Black people move into a neighborhood, the prices depreciated. It was just commonly understood. In actuality, often when a black person bought a house in a white neighborhood, they were charged more than a white person would have been for the same house because racism, making the property values of the surrounding houses go up because of how much that black person was willing to pay. Like this idea that property values nosedived when blacks moved in was a complete fabrication, but it was strong. So strong that it took 20 more years before the FHA was forced to end its racial restrictions on insurance when Congress passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968, prohibiting discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race. Despite all of this, the racially restrictive zoning leading to race-based restrictive covenants and the FHA's refusal to insure houses purchased by black buyers or in black neighborhoods, despite all of that, the immediate aftermath of the Shelley versus Kramer decision was that after 1948, black homeowners did, in fact, begin moving into white neighborhoods where restrictive covenants once barred them. And private real estate agents saw this as an opportunity. They began practicing what was known as blockbusting. If a black family moved into or near a white neighborhood, the real estate agents would hand out pamphlets and post billboards warning of declining property values and encroaching black residents taking over their safe, beautiful neighborhoods. In some cases, these predatory real estate agents would hire black women to push babies in prams down the streets of white neighborhoods or pay black men to roll down the streets of white neighborhoods blasting music out of their car speakers. The real estate agents would then come through and warn of deflation property values and black encroachment. And this led to white panic and white people would then sell their homes to these real estate agents at deflated prices who would then turn around and sell the houses back to black buyers at inflated prices, pocketing the difference. This led in part to the massive white flight to the suburbs in the 50s and 60s and to the further segregation of cities. This combined with the types of resources that just come when property values are higher, because you got higher property taxes, there's more money for schools and infrastructure, etc then gentrification and reinforcement of racist stereotypes, and then later the racially disparate impact of the 2008 housing crisis, which was led by subprime mortgage loans that were disproportionately targeted at black home buyers. This has all continued to enforce what people call de facto segregation, or segregation that just happens by circumstance. When in reality, the basis of the segregation was created and enforced, not by de facto segregation, but by de jure segregation. Segregation enforced by law that can still be seen and felt in virtually every metropolitan area in the United States today. St. Louis once again paints a clear picture of this phenomenon. In 1945, when the Shelleys purchased 4600 Labadee Avenue, it was in an area that had a whites-only restrictive covenant, a historically white neighborhood. Once they moved in and won their case, the race-based restrictive covenants in the neighborhood were no longer enforceable. Property values artificially decreased due to this fear of blacks moving into a neighborhood, and eventually the neighborhood was entirely black, as whites fled to the suburbs or south to other parts of the city. Today, St. Louis is famously segregated by what's known as the Del Mar Divide, with blacks predominantly residing north of Del Mar Boulevard and whites residing, along with most of the wealth and access to resources like parks, museums, and zoos, south of Del Mar Boulevard. North of Del Mar Boulevard, the racial makeup of St. Louis is 99% black. South of Del Mar Boulevard is 70% white. North of Del Mar Boulevard, the average home value is $78,000. South of Del Mar, the average 
average home value is $310,000. In the North, the percentage of people with a bachelor's degree is 5%, and in the South, it's 67%. As author Richard Rothstein says in his book, The Color of Law, which is an obligatory read for all Americans, go buy it, by failing to recognize that we now live with the severe, enduring effects of de jure segregation, we avoid confronting our constitutional obligation to reverse it. Desegregation is not just a desirable policy, it is a constitutional as well as moral obligation that we are required to fulfill. Let bygones be bygones is not a legitimate approach if we wish to call ourselves a constitutional democracy. In the end, however, we have lulled ourselves into the false notion that we live in a society that just happens to be segregated by coincidence or personal choice. And recent Supreme Court decisions reinforce this notion, making it a legal impossibility for anyone to seek recourse for the wrongs imposed upon them for generations by systematic, state-sanctioned, and state-enforced racial segregation in every city in America. To learn more, check out Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Thank you again to my partner on today's video, Warby Parker. Don't forget to try Warby Parker's free home try-on kit. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Lija. If you like this video, you might also like this video that I made all about why food in America is killing us. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.